Hello, and welcome back to a short series on the basics of performing density functional theory calculations. This series, based on the excellent textbook by David Scholl and Janice H. Deckel, aims to give you the tools to perform DFT calculations on your own. In the previous episode, we looked at where DFT came from, we examined the basic approximations that underlie the method, and hopefully by the end of it, we came to appreciate its simplistic beauty when it comes to finding solutions to the Schrodinger equation. This episode, DFT calculations for simple solids, will develop some vocabulary and introduce the procedures that will be required for setting up DFT calculations. By the end of this episode, you'll hopefully be able to calculate the lattice constant of a crystalline material. If you're already familiar with the concept of crystals, you know that they are solid materials whose constituent atoms, molecules, or ions are arranged in a highly ordered repeating lattice structure which extends in all directions. The smallest portion of a crystal lattice that shows the three-dimensional pattern of the entire crystal is known as the unit cell. A crystal is, in essence, just a unit cell that's been repeated over and over in 3D space. One of the simplest types of crystals that can be described are those that possess a simple cubic structure. A real crystal that adopts this structure is elemental polonium. The simple cubic unit cell, as you might have guessed, is a simple cube. This cube has sides of length a, with an atom found at each corner. The length a of the cube is the lattice constant. A useful way for us to describe the repeating pattern of the crystal lattice is through the use of vectors. The vectors that define how this pattern repeats are called the supercell vectors. The volume defined by these supercell vectors and the position of the atoms contained within this volume are collectively referred to as the supercell. For a simple cubic structure, the vectors that describe this repeating pattern have the form a1 is equal to the lattice constant times the vector 1, 0, 0. a2 is equal to the lattice constant times the vector 0, 1, 0. and a3 is equal to the lattice constant times 0, 0, 1. The position of every atom in the crystal can be described through a linear combination of these vectors, with the formula r is equal to n1 times the vector a1, plus n2 times the vector a2, plus n3 times the vector a3 for any integers n1, n2, or n3. In case you don't believe me, I'll go through a few simple examples. The most trivial example is the position of the atom situated at the origin, r000. We can obtain its position through a linear combination of the vectors a1, a2, and a3 when each of their coefficients n1 through n3 are equal to 0. Another simple example is the atom position R100. Its position can be obtained by a linear combination of the supercell vectors using the coefficients 1, 0, and 0 respectively. The final example I'll give is for the atom at position R111. This position can be obtained by a linear combination using the coefficients 1, 1, and 1 respectively. I'll leave it to you to find all the positions of the other atoms in the supercell. The most basic way to define a supercell is called the primitive cell. The primitive cell contains the minimum possible number of atoms and minimum possible supercell vector lengths that are required in order to describe the repeating pattern of the entire crystal. For the simple cubic structure, the primitive cell contains just one atom. For convenience, we place this atom at the corner of the cube situated at the origin, 0, 0, 0. Repeating the primitive cell in any direction just requires a linear combination of the supercell vectors that we've already seen. Thus, the primitive cell can be completely described by an atom placed at the origin and the three supercell vectors a0, 0, 0, 0, a0, and 0, 0, a. Now that we understand some of the language supercells, we can apply this to a crystal structure that will probably be of greater interest to us, a face-centered cubic or FCC structure. There are many examples of materials that have this structure. Some notable examples are the coinage metals, copper, silver, and gold. The FCC unit cell is very similar to the simple cubic structure. It's a cube that has sides of length a, with an atom at each corner. But, additionally, it has an atom at the center of each face, hence the name, face centered cubic. Creative, huh? The supercell vectors that describe a cell with an FCC structure have the following form. a1 is equal to the lattice constant times 1 half, 1 half, 0. A2 is equal to the lattice constant times 0, 1 half, 1 half. And the vector A3 is equal to the lattice constant times 1 half, 0, 1 half. As before, through a linear combination of these supercell vectors, we can describe every possible atomic position in the crystal. Now, we'll quickly look at what combinations of supercell vectors we need in order to describe the positions of the atoms. 
We'll revisit the atoms of positions R00, R110, and R111. Like before, it's trivial to obtain the position of the atom at R000, with each coefficient n1 through n3 simply being zero. The atom at position R111 can, similarly to before, be obtained by a linear combination of supercell vectors with coefficients 1, 1, and 1, respectively. A bit more interesting is the combination of vectors required to reach the atom at position R100. In this case, the linear combination of supercell vectors requires coefficients 1, minus 1, and 1, respectively. I'll leave it to you to find the coefficients required to describe all 14 atoms in the FCC unit cell. If you're quick, you'll notice, just like in the case of the simple cubic earlier, the primitive cell for an FCC material can be described using just a single atom. For convenience, we'll place this atom at the origin. The supercell vectors that describe the primitive cell are a over 2, a over 2, 0, 0, a over 2, a over 2, and a over 2, 0, a over 2. So now that we know how to define a supercell, we'll examine how we can, at least in principle, predict using DFT calculation the lattice constant that will be observed in nature for this material. This will be accomplished by calculating the total energy of a material as a function of the lattice spacing, E total as a function of A. A result from doing these calculations is shown at the right. The black squares you see are the values of the calculated total energy as a result of the given lattice spacing. The lines you see joining these dots result from fitting these points by some function. The shape of the curve we obtain is simple. It has a single minimum at a value of A that we'll call A0. This means that the total energy will be minimized if the lattice spacing was set to A0. Since nature always seeks to minimize energy, we have a direct physical prediction from our calculations. DFT predicts that the lattice constant of material will be A0. A well-known and detailed mathematical treatment of the total energy versus lattice constant is the birch mernigan equation of state for isotropic solids. In this equation, A0 is the equilibrium lattice constant that we're looking for. E0 is the value of the total energy at the point A0, or in other words, the minimum total energy. V0 is the equilibrium volume per atom. B0 is the bulk modulus at zero pressure and B prime of zero is the partial derivative of the bulk modulus with respect to pressure at constant temperature. We can apply the birch mernigan or BM equation to a set of E total that we've calculated for a range of lattice parameters A while treating A0, B0, B prime of zero, and E0 as fitting parameters. In this way, we can obtain the ideal lattice constant A0 that minimizes the energy of our material. So now that we understand what we're actually trying to do, we can try our hand at conducting some DFT calculations so we can obtain the ideal lattice parameter for an FCC crystal. We'll do this using the Vienna Ab Initio Simulation Package, or VASP for short. A VASP calculation needs five input files to proceed. In alphabetical order, these are the NCAR, K points, POSCAR, PODCAR, and submission files. Briefly, these files serve the following purposes. First, the NCAR file contains almost all the directions that tell VASP what type of calculation to perform. Essentially, what to do and how to do it. Next, the K points file specifies the block vectors that will be used to sample the Brill Luan zone. The Postgraph file defines the dimensions of the supercell, the number and types of atoms, as well as their arrangements within the supercell. The Podgraph file contains the pseudopotential information for each atomic species in the calculation. The job submission file contains the instructions required for your computer to run the VASP calculation. The instructions contained within this file are suited to the specific computer or supercomputer that'll host the calculation. Additionally, it's possible to automate some of the more tedious aspects of carrying out VASP calculations through careful construction of scripts and placing these scripts into the submission file. With the exception of the podcar, these input files must be constructed by you by hand using a word processor of your choice. It's important to note that VASP doesn't tolerate hidden characters or tabs in these files. Additionally, it'll be necessary to convert text files that have a Windows file format to Unix file format before you can perform your calculations. In the rest of this episode, I'll walk you through how to construct the input files necessary to perform this VASP calculation. The first file we look at is the INCAR. This file specifies most of the necessary parameters required for the calculation to run. There's no particular order that the parameters have to be listed in the NCAR, though I've grouped them together here by their function. If you're curious, you can visit the VASP wiki to find detailed information on what each tag does, 
what its default values are, and how you might be able to play with it in order to improve your calculation's accuracy or performance. If a parameter isn't explicitly mentioned in the incar file, VASP will instead use a default value. In general, most defaults are fine. Adjusting the defaults can affect the speed and accuracy of your calculation, so it's recommended that you do so with care. In the VASP file, pound signs or exclamation marks cause text following them to be commented out, which can be useful for labeling what a specific tag in your incar does, or to turn the tag off if it's not needed. I'll briefly discuss now individual important parameters that have been listed. Some of these are parameters that you'll need to adjust depending on the type of calculation you're trying to run. The first two tags I'll mention are kpar and ncore. These are required for parallelizing VASP calculations over the available computer cores. Ideal values for these parameters can be identified through trial and error, but you can start with the recommended values of kpar and ncore equal to 4. The next tags to discuss are nsw and ibrion. As seen here, nsw equals 0 means that the energy of an electron density is minimized for a single given arrangement of fixed nuclei. Once the electron density that minimizes the energy for this arrangement of nuclei has been identified, the calculation ends. This is known as a single point calculation, as the coordinates of the nuclei aren't allowed to vary. The electron density is only evaluated at a single point on the potential energy surface. IBR ion tells us to perform a single point calculation if IBR ion is equal to 1, a molecular dynamics calculation if IBR ion is equal to 0, or a relaxation calculation for IBR ion equal to 1 through 8. The final tags to point out are the GGA, which specifies the type of generalized gradient approximation to use, and IVDW, which specifies the type of van der Waals correction to apply to the energy. A widely used standard for the GGA exchange correlation functional is the Purdue Burke Ernsterhoff or PBE functional, and can be chosen by specifying GGA is equal to PE. If you don't specify the type of exchange correlation functional in your NCAR, VAS will default to the type used in constructing your POTCAR file. Regarding IVDW, many of the popular local and semi-local density functionals are unable to correctly describe van der Waals interactions that result from dynamical correlations between fluctuating charge distributions. A workaround for this problem is to add a correction to the Cohn-Sham DFT energy. A typical correction I've used is the zero-damping DFT D3 method of Grimm. It's worth evaluating which exchange correlation functional and dispersion correction will work best for your system. Different functionals and dispersion corrections might better be able to replicate your experimental results. The next file to look at is the k-points file. The first line of this file is a comment line. What it says is up to you, but it's always helpful to comment on what type of k-point mesh you're using. The second line selects how you wish to generate the mesh of k-points for your DFT calculation. The value 0 means that automatic mesh of k-points will be generated by VASP, and it's usually a safe option. The value on the third line designates the mode of k-point generation. A very common mode is the Monkhorst pack scheme, centered on the gamma point, which is the center of the brill one zone. The final line specifies any additional offset you wish to apply in moving the k-point mesh away from the gamma point. But what does this mean? What are k-points, and why do we need to specify them? Well, it turns out that this is because for many of the mathematical problems posed by DFT, it's more convenient to solve them in terms of reciprocal space, also called k-space, rather than in real space. The reason for this is a consequence from Bloch's theorem, though for now I won't really go into detail about how. Instead, I'll give an overview of the important concepts behind the different settings in the k-points file. Much like how the primitive cell in real space is the minimum possible volume that contains all the information necessary to describe an entire crystal, a similar type of primitive cell can be described in reciprocal space. This reciprocal space primitive cell has many special properties and is given a name, the brillo wand zone, or BZ. Points inside the brillo wand zone, with a special significance, are also given names. One of the most important of these points is called the gamma point, which is at the center of the brillo wand zone. A key concept of reciprocal space is that there exists an inverse relationship between distances in real space and their corresponding reciprocal distances in k-space. Small distances in real space become large distances in k-space, and correspondingly, large distances in real space become small distances in k-space. For our DFT calculation, VAS will be evaluating integrals of functions at points within the brillo wand zone. An important approximation being made when evaluating these integrals is to approximate them instead as summations over discrete k-points. A popular method for choosing which k-points are sampled for these summations was developed by Monkhorst and Pack in 1976. If you wish to read the original paper in Physical Reviews B, you can find it here. For their method, all that's required is to specify how many k-points you wish to sample in each direction in reciprocal space. 
Something to note is that the more k-points that are sampled in this calculation, which means a denser k-point mesh, the more accurate, the more computationally costly, calculation will become. Due to the reciprocal nature of k-space compared to real space, this means that the density of k-points is greater for real space supercells with large supercell vectors compared to supercells with small supercell vectors. A rule of thumb if you want to compare two calculations that might have had different supercell sizes is that calculations that have similar densities of k-points will have a similar level of precision. A rather straightforward file is the POSCAR. This file contains all the information regarding the positions of your atoms and tells vast of the dimensions of your supercell. The first line of the POSCAR file is a comment line. What it says is up to you. It'll be very useful to you if this line always clearly describes the system that's being contained within the POSCAR. The next line of the POSCAR is the universal scaling factor. Essentially, it's used as a coefficient to scale up or down your supercell vectors. We'll adjust this factor when we're trying to find the ideal lattice parameter for an FCC copper crystal. The next three lines describe your three supercell vectors. In this case, they are the vectors that describe a primitive cell for an FCC copper crystal. The sixth line defines the chemical identity of the atoms in your supercell. Each distinct type of atom is listed in the order they appear in the POSCAR, separated by a space. The line beneath specifies the number of that type of atom that's in your POSCAR. This number must correspond with the order in which the atoms of that type appear in the POSCAR. For example, if I had one copper atom and two oxygen atoms, I would write in the sixth line, Cu, space, zero, and on the seventh line, one, space, two. I would then have to ensure that my three nuclei coordinates are given in the same order below, copper first, and then two oxygen atoms. The eighth line tells Vast whether or not to allow certain atoms to move. These atoms will need to have an added true or false flag to enable motion along each particular Cartesian direction. These three flags must be added to the end of the line that lists the coordinates. For example, if I want my copper atom to move in the x direction but not in y or z, I would add t space f space f after the nuclei coordinates. The ninth line tells VASP how you supply the coordinates, whether using Cartesian coordinates or with direct, also called fractional coordinates. Cartesian coordinates can be obtained from direct coordinates by applying the formula you see here, where x1, x2, and x3 are your x, y, and z components, and b1, b2, and b3 are your supercell vectors. You can obtain the direct coordinates from Cartesian coordinates simply by applying the inverse of this operation. The final lines of your POSCAR will list the coordinates of each atom in your supercell. Each line corresponds to a single atom. As you might remember from just before, the Boolean values listed at the end of each line specify whether or not an atom is free to move along the x, y, or z coordinates respectively. The last of the special VASP input files is the POTCAR. The type of podcar I've always used were generated using the projector augmented wave method and the generalized gradient approximation with the Purdue Burke Ernzerhoff functional. Podcars have been constructed in this way for a large variety of atoms and can be found for each atom within the folder titled podcar underscore PBE inside the potentials folder that's found inside the main VASP folder. Once located, the correct podcar can then be copied over to the calculation directory. If there are multiple types of atoms in a calculation, a new POTCAR must be constructed by concatenating the individual POTCAR files for each element type in the order that they are listed in the POSCAR file. But what is the POTCAR? In short, it's a file that contains the pseudopotential generated for each atom in a VASP calculation. The point of these pseudopotentials is to reduce computational burden. From a physical point of view, core electrons aren't that important when it comes to defining chemical bonding or many of the other physically interesting characteristics of materials. A pseudopotential, in essence, replaces the costly calculations for the contribution of the core electrons to the electron density with a smooth density that matches the various important physical and mathematical properties of the true ion core. The properties of the core electrons remain fixed in this approximate fashion during a DFT calculation. This is called the frozen core approximation. There are different ways to construct pseudopotentials for DFT calculations. One of the most widely used methods of defining pseudopotentials is based on the works by Vanderbilt. These are the ultra-soft pseudopotentials, or USPPs. A disadvantage of the USPPs is that constructing the pseudopotential for each atom requires a number of empirical factors to be specified. Another frozen core approach that avoids some of the disadvantages of the USPPs is the projector augmented wave, or PAW, PAW method that was originally introduced by Blockel and adapted for plane wave calculations by Kress and Jobert. Finally, once all your other VAS files are together, you're almost ready to submit a DFT calculation. All that remains is to construct a submission file for your calculation. 
The only thing your submission file really requires is a way to tell your computer how to open and execute the VASP program. A very simple bash script for submitting a VASP calculation is as follows. On the first line, it's a command that tells the computer that you're using a bash script. The next lines define the variables that tell the computer the number of computer cores the VASP will run on, as well as the path to where VASP is installed. The final line of the script tells the computer to use OpenMPI to execute VASP in parallel on the requested CPU cores. However, we can save ourselves a lot of headache and hassle if we include a few more commands into our bash script. Here I've defined a few more variables, specifically incar, kpoints, podcar, and poscar. You may be asking yourselves, why have I defined these additional values? That is a very good question. The reason for this is that VASP only recognizes the input files if they're correctly titled. For example, the incar file must be titled INCAR in all capitals with no additional text or punctuation. The same is true for the kpoints, poscar, and podcar files. Later in the submission script, I use the cp or copy bash command to convert the names of the labeled script input files from a user friendly format to a VASP friendly one. The array lattice values specifies the values of the universal scaling factor I wish to use in order to scale up or down my lattice constant. By specifying these in an array, it saves having to edit this universal scaling factor by hand in each poscar. The more lattice values I want, the more values I need to add by hand. The real meat of the script is next. Here, I run a for loop over all the variables specified in the lattice values array. Inside the for loop, I have an if then loop that creates a calculation directory if one doesn't already exist using the make directory command mkdir. I then have a second if then loop that only runs if the calculation directory exists. Inside the second if then loop, all of the necessary VAST files are copied over into the calculation directory using the copy command. Next, the universal scaling factor in the poscar file is changed to be a particular variable using the sed or stream editor command. Finally, the script steps into the calculation directory, executes the VAST program, and upon its completion steps back out into the working directory, ready to execute the next step for the loop. Once the for loop has iterated through each of the variables in the lattice values array, the script is finished. This simple script has saved about two to three minutes of work that would otherwise be required to create 10 different calculation directories and set up all the required files, and then to execute the VAST program for each calculation directory individually. In addition, this script can now be used to find the lattice constants of any system you want just by changing the variables at the start. Doing this by hand will be much worse. And with that, you should now be ready to try calculating some ideal lattice constants on your own. As an aside, if you're using a supercomputer cluster like Cynet to perform your VASP calculation, your submission script will require a few more instructions before it will be able to run. More information specifically regarding how to set up and submit your VASP calculation on the Cynet supercomputer cluster can be found on the Cynet wiki by going to the link at the bottom of your screen. The important variables that you'll need to worry about have been highlighted with blue bolded text. These will be specific to the size and type of job you'll be submitting to the Cynet cluster. And with that, we come to the end of part two. In this episode, we develop some of the vocabulary and introduce the procedures required in order to set up DFT calculations using VASP. I hope you found it informative, hopefully useful, and that you'll join me next time 